think we're ready to get going? Yes. Great. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Stacy Dim, the Executive Director of the ARC of Washington State. Um, and I have my amazing co-host here, Brandy Mons from the Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, as we get started, buenos dias. I want to be sure everyone can access the event in Spanish who wants to. Um, oops, sorry, I lost my information here. Um, so antes de uh, comenzar, quiero asegurarme de que todos puedan acceder a este evento en español que quieran. Uh, so everyone, please select either English or Spanish on the globe at the bottom of your screen. So just take a quick look at the bottom of your screen um, and you will see that globe. Um, todos por favor selecciones inglés o español en el globo, globo que ve en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Gracias. Um, if anyone has difficulty with either their Spanish or English interpretation, please place it in the chat. Okay. As I mentioned again, my name is Stacy Dim. I'm the executive director at the ARC of Washington State, and Brandy and I have some great guests to introduce you to today. Um, and Brandy, I'll let you get us started. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Brandy Montz uh, with the Developmental Disability Council, and I am excited to welcome you to our pre-session on Advocacy Days uh, for this, this coming session. We have a really amazing lineup of speakers for you today including uh, the Gov's office, the governor's office, uh, legislators, um, and um, the purpose is to help you prepare for our legislative process. We're going to learn how it works, um, and we're going to think about what's ahead of us in the 2023 legislative session. Uh, before I hand um, it back over to Stacy, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that this virtual event is taking place throughout our great state of Washington. Um, and our state is home to 29 federally recognized tribes. 42 um, of them total share uh, traditional homelands and waterways. Um, I'm coming to you from Kent, Washington, which is the unceded ancestral land of the Duwamish people. And so we wanted to take a moment and just um, honor and support the sovereignty and self-determination of indigenous people locally and worldwide. I will put a map um, in the chat. If you don't know uh, what uh, uh, ancestral lands you are standing on and are interested, uh, you can use the map in the chat to look that up. Thank you, Stacy. Um, and um, we want to thank you for your willingness uh, to be mindful about Native people and all of the differences that we um, all have here within this room in this space. Uh, because that's how we make good work happen in our community is by understanding and accepting each other um, and helping build inclusive communities where um, we honor and uh, move forward as a community. So thanks so much. And I'll hand it back over to Stacey. Sorry about that. I'm muted. So as family members, people with developmental disabilities, allies and advocates here today, we know that we face, mm -hmm. oh, can people hear me okay? So that I'm, I needed to unmute, I apologize. I'll get started again. <laughs> yeah. As family mem members, people with developmental disabilities, allies and advocates here today, we know that we face a number of pressing issues. A housing crisis that keeps people with developmental disabilities boarded in hospitals, in nursing homes, in RHCs, unable to access community-based services, a lack of services for our senior families and caregivers in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who are unable to plan for their son or daughter's future when they can no longer provide care. We lack a waiver that allows working families to buy into Medicaid, to stave off bankruptcy or dropping out of the workforce, to care for their medically complex child. And we have gaps in available community-based services across the state due to unfunded services, low wages, and a workforce crisis. Washington remains stubbornly in the lower 25% of national spending in DD services. And we have some work to do so that families and individuals with IDD can get access to the services they need when they need them. It's important to know that over 80% of people with IDD live with their families, and we must support family caregivers as well as individuals with IDD 
to have agency and opportunity to live in the community as independently as possible. And we need a well-trained and reliable workforce to support this effort. So that's what are some of the things we might um, address today as we learn a little more about the legislative process. Um, to that end, we'd like to start with our first guest, Amber Leaders, if Amber is on. Amber's on, great. Hi, Amber. Good morning. Morning. Sorry, I'm having, I'm having some sunlight difficult. I'm I was here. having some, I have some sunlight coming in today too. It's kind of nice. Um, so everybody, Amber is our Senior Policy Advisor on Behavioral Health, Aging and Disability uh, to Governor Inley. And I thought I'd give her just a minute to introduce herself and talk a little bit about the portfolio that she covers. Sure, thanks, Stacy. Um, so like Stacy said, I'm uh, one of the governor's senior policy advisors. He has a number of policy advisors that cover a variety of different areas. Um, I'm one of the two health policy advisors. And within my portfolio, I cover behavioral health, aging, disability, and poverty. Um, and you know that covers a lot of human services in terms of the agency. I work with, I work with, I cover almost all of the, all of what DSHS does. I do a, and a significant amount of work with the state health care authority, as well as the state department of health. So um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of who I am and what I do. I've been with the governor's office since 2019. Amber, I know you um, work on such a variety of issues and, you know, developmental disabilities isn't just its own category. It kind of crosses over into some of the things that you mentioned. Um, poverty in particular, um, we have about 30% of people are duly diagnosed with a behavioral health condition. Um, and I know that you, you are really good at, at crossing over um, those topics. Are there, um, in terms of focuses for this legislative committee, do you see that there will be um, some particular emphasis on any of those areas? Uh, sure. I mean, I think there will be an emphasis on a lot of things that you have already talked about about Stacy, Certainly one of the things that's top of mind is workforce. Um, pretty much any, all the sectors that I work in in my portfolio are having uh, impacts related to workforce. We've seen it in our healthcare system, in our long-term care system, for people who um, have intellectual and developmental disabilities, in poverty, there's all kinds of um, um, places like childcare, homeless shelters, um, where we have just are really struggling with workforce right now. So I anticipate that to be a significant focus this session um, in terms of how do we how do we address that and make sure that we're we're maintaining and sustaining a really robust workforce across all of these different different sectors. So that'll be one. Um, another area that's really across uh, systems look is working on the issue of individuals who have gone into acute care hospitals and needing to move back out to the community, but who, who are having a um, who are stalling um, for a variety of reasons, either you know because of what our long term care or behavioral health system can accept and what they're taking in, in terms of capacity there, um, as well as individuals who have needs that are specialized and where we may have gaps in our systems. For example, individuals who have traumatic brain injury, uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disability, uh, or individuals who have a criminal history of some kind can be um, particularly hard to move out to community-based services. So I think that will also be a really big area of focus. And that's for both our adults and our children. Uh, we're seeing the same issue um, for both adults and for young people. The solutions there are somewhat different, um, but will be a big area of, of focus. Um, and then I also just think in general, uh, behavioral health is an area that will be a really big, big focus this session in terms of things in my portfolio. Um, our behavioral health system has been in transformation the last several years in terms of building up the system and building a community-based system of care, moving away from our state institutions, which is a, is a really important step to be taking, but we have a lot of work to do to make sure our community capacity is sufficient to help and manage all the individuals who have behavioral health needs. We've seen a rise in the number of individuals who have experienced a behavioral health need, either a mental health or a substance use need as during the pandemic. Um, we've also seen a significant increase with our youth uh, who have exp experienced a fair amount of mental health and substance use issues um, from the pandemic. So I think there's gonna be some continued focus on how do we build out and support our community behavioral health system so that everybody who needs access to behavioral health care um, can get it? That's great. Thank you. And I, you know, we know that the decision packages from the agencies are out and the governor forms his budget in December. 
Um, do you have a, a way to simplify for people? What's the connection between the decision packages and the governor's budget? And how does the governor's budget get used by the legislature? Sure, I'll do my best to um, to go through that. So yes, there's a there's a long process to building the governor's budget that starts almost as soon as session ends each year, where the agencies will begin um, working on decision packages. Um, which are budget requests that they submit to the governor's office. And they spend most of the summer working with stakeholders, working with our office, thinking about what are the big items and topics that need to be addressed in the next coming session. And in September of each year, they submit decision packages to the Office of Financial Management, um, all of the things that the agencies are recommending for the upcoming session uh, and that's it and that's all that's agencies across the board it's not just in my portfolio it's um, natural resources transportation labor and industry so it's it's a big package of things that all come to the governor's office in the office of financial management um, it comes to our process and we work through october november or december to build the governor's budget which will be released usually it's around the second week of december when the governor's budget is published and we do a lot of work. We go through what the agencies have submitted. We do review with them. We have conversations with stakeholders about what's what people like, what they don't like, what's maybe missing um, to put together the governor's budget that gets published. Um, we do that based on every, there's revenue forecasts that come out um, periodically throughout the year. And so that indicates to us how much money the governor's office will have to be able to spend on legislative session through the revenue forecast. So for example, we had, um, I think the last one was in August. We have another revenue forecast coming up in on November 18th. And that revenue forecast is is will give us kind of the playing field for what the governor can include in his budget. It tells us how much money, you know, do we have that goes into maintenance level, which is sort of ongoing things, things that we're required to do under law, um, pieces that, you know, must be funded. And that takes up a really significant portion of the budget. And then how much space do we have for new items, policy items? Um, or other kinds of initiatives that that we want to do this year. Um, and then the governor's budget is really, you know, a starting point for the legislature. It's our proposal on how we think it, it we the state should best spend the dollars that it is going to have. It makes recommendations, again, across all of the portfolios. Um, the governor, you know, typically has some priority areas. So, for example, he almost always has some climate priorities, as many people know, Jay Inslee is the climate governor, and he does a lot of focus on making sure that we're doing things in that environmental space. Um, I also anticipate that there'll be a lot of work and effort around housing and homelessness this year. That's a big issue um, and has been a longstanding focus of the governor uh, in addressing housing and homelessness. And so... Um, so the governor will come out with his recommendations on what we think the best way is to spend the dollars. And then it'll go to the legislature to build their own budget. And they will do sort of similar process to what we've done. They'll look to what the governor has recommended, but they'll also look to sort of their own priorities and work that they've done with stakeholders and constituents and others to finalize a, a budget through the legislative session. That's great. That was a lot of important information. And I thank you so much. Um, just one last quick question, um, just to wrap up for about 30 seconds. Do you, what challenges do you think that we're going to be facing and what should we be aware of as advocates? So I think one of the biggest things to be aware of is that, so, and I'm not a budget person. I want to be really clear when I say this, but my understanding of where we're sitting this year with, with the budget is not, is going to be different than we've had the last couple of years in terms of the availability of funds. It is going to be a much tighter year which means that there's harder decisions that have to be made on some of the things that will get funded or will will make it into the final budget. Um, and so I think that's just something to be mindful is to be to be thinking about and to be strategic about, which is how do you prioritize and how do you think about what are the things that really rise to the top if there's a limited field of what's going to be um, accepted into the the final budget. Um, and so, and the change is, you know, we've had a lot of access to some federal dollars through the pandemic, some COVID relief dollars and some other things that, you know, we won't have in the same way this year. Um, we also have a number of programs that we've been doing through the pandemic that have been funded through those dollars that the federal dollars will end and we have to figure out solutions of how do we make sure that those continue under general fund state dollars. So those will be some of the big questions of, you know, how do we, we, how do we still advance and do really good things policy-wise if we're if we're living in a more limited universe in terms of available funds? 
I think that'll be the, one of the biggest challenges this year. Okay. Thank you. That's a lot to absorb too. I, I appreciate your time so much for coming today and we invite you to stay. We got some great speakers coming up here. Um, and again, we know you're there for us and we appreciate your role. Yeah. Thank you. I'm okay. I'm gonna I was just going to say thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it's always great to see you. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Brandy. All right. Um, yes, thank you, Amber Leaders, for joining us. And I know uh, some folks have their hands up or maybe you have a question. Um, if we don't have a chance because of our, our packed schedule to get to your questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to collect those um, during this event. All right, it is my pleasure to um, introduce Representative Lori Jenkins from the 27th Legislative District next. The, 27th, the 27th uh, Legislative District covers parts of Tacoma, Ruston, and Fife Heights. Um, she is a Washington uh, State uh, first woman and first out lesbian speaker of the House. She has helped us with guardianship issues in the past and has been a huge um, advocate for the IDD community. And I also want to congrat congratulate her on her win uh, last night. So welcome, Representative Lori Jenkins. Thanks. Um, thank you, Brandy. It's great to be here with folks. And I hate to start off with an apology, but I bumped out of a meeting in my other job to join this meeting. I've got to go back to it by 1030. So I'll be um, I'll try to be quick with my comments so that there's time for people to ask questions. I also really appreciate your land acknowledgement and want to tell you that I'm coming to you from the land of the Puyallup people uh, in Tacoma. I was asked to talk just a little bit about what's the role of the speaker and, and what's the role of the rules committee. Um, and so I'll just start off and say the speaker is an unusual position uh, in comparison to other positions because it's actually elected by the whole House of Representatives. Um, so we will have the, whichever party has the majority of members elects a speaker designate within the within their party uh, and we'll hold those elections in a couple of weeks within our caucus and then whoever's elected speaker designate will then stand on the opening day of session for election by the the whole body um there are only uh, there's only two other positions that have that, that um that are elected by the body that is the uh, chief clerk of the house and the speaker pro tem uh is also elected that way the speaker's job is really kind of to run the house well not kind of actually to do it although it's really staff that does that, that does most of the work as is usually the case but the speaker serves as the presiding officer uh, for floor debates although you'll notice that we have um, a deputy speaker pro tem, a speaker pro tem, and deputy speaker pro tems. Um, though those have historically been Tina Orwall and Dan Bernoski, and they preside over a lot of things because I am frequently uh, busy doing kind of some of my other responsibilities, including chairing the executive rules committee, which is the the committee that kind of governs administrative response administrative issues within the, within the house usually not a big deal but over the past couple of years of the pandemic really big deal uh, in terms of that work i also chair the house rules committee which i'll talk a little bit about in a minute um, and i uh, have the responsibility to appoint members to the standing and the statutory committees in the house I do that, and as did Speaker Chop, through having the, the strangest committee in the world work on this. It's called the Committee on Committees. Um, and we meet together to take into account uh, needs and desires of individual members, needs of the caucus, needs of the people of the state of Washington. And that process, our Committee on Committees, uh, which is really a caucus committee, um, only focused on kind of not so much out external input, but our members talking with each other. Uh, we'll start meeting soon also to make those appointments to committees. And we also decide what committees there will be. Eventually, the, the entire caucus votes on those. Those are recommended by the Committee on Committees. I also sign every single bill uh, that is passed off of the House floor uh, and the Senate floor. And then I, as I said, I have to, I, 
over the role of speaker is to oversee all of the employees in the house. But usually it's the chief clerk that's carrying out most of those management responsibilities. So let me turn just for a minute and talk about the rules committee because it's the um, it's a committee that is not, I think, well understood by people and folks ask me to talk about it a little bit. As I said, I chair that committee. Um, it's one of the standing committees in the House. We have 20 committees in the House, um, and this is one of them. The real role of the, if you think about the Rules Committee, every committee that we have in the House and the whole way the House is structured is to kind of be a funnel right? Members file bills on whatever topics they are interested in. There's a lot of them. And then they go through, some of them get committee hearings, some don't. That's a, that narrows the funnel. Some of them get out of the committee, some don't. That narrows the funnel. Some have to go to, if they, if they have a fiscal impact, they might have to go to a second committee, a budget committee, narrows the field more. Eventually, uh, all of the bills that have come out, been voted out of committees come to the rules committee, which is the final kind of stopping committee stopping place before a bill moves to the floor of the house. The, one of the things that's very different about the rules committee than other committees is the rules committee does not amend bills at all. Uh, in fact, it's not allowed to amend bills. It's only those policy committees and the budget committees that are able to do that. It's really a gatekeeping committee. It's a bipartisan committee with uh, both Republicans and Democrats as uh, all of our policy committees um, are. And, um, it, and so what usually happens is we have regular rules committee meetings. What we've historically had is had them regularly throughout session, a couple of times a week, usually once bills start to come out of committees and we start to have floor action. And every, every member of that committee will be told before the meeting, you're going to get a chance to, to, to pull two bills out of committee or one bill out of committee. Um, the assumption is if there's a bill in rules that's available to be pulled and a member wants, wants it pulled, it will be pulled. But we do, when we meet in person, we actually physically vote on that. Um, the, the whole committee does. I'll talk a little bit about virtual rules in a minute. Um, but I, as speaker, do have the uh, ability to put a bill on hold and not, not allow it to be considered for a, a rules pull. Uh, that usually happens when I have stakeholders who come to me and express a concern about a bill, and I, I'm asking members to work it to work something out, work a question that's been raised out. Sometimes we start to get an accumulation of bills that um, that are cost a lot of money, and uh, I haven't really talked to the budget team, and so I want to make sure that we're aligned well. And so sometimes that can put it on on hold. So there are a lot of different things that let that make me want to wait. Sometimes when I'm reading a bill report, I read a bill bill reports on all of the bills that come into rules. I have a question about it and I ask staff to get my question answered before it's allowed to be pulled. Once a bill is pulled from rules, it, um, it's then eligible to be uh, moved to the floor and voted on. It doesn't mean it necessarily will be. It just means it's eligible for that. And that, that work is primarily done by the floor leader and, and me trying to build uh, calendars that move priority bills off of the floor. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it's very disappointing to people to have a bill pulled from rules and not make it off the floor, but time, time is our biggest enemy a lot of times in, in that. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I hope, I always worry that when I get into talking about the rules committee, I actually start in the middle and when I should be starting at the beginning and it's because I'm so steeped in what this is. So I'm very open to questions, but we've been having, a, during COVID, we, uh, in fact, last session, I think we had only virtual rules committee meetings. Um, and so usually what happens there is the members of the rules committee get a list of bills that are eligible to be pulled from rules. They're told how many polls they can do, can they they pull one bill, two bill, three three bills, and then we just uh, they just start sending in an email to my attorney, Chris Kilduff, and telling her what bills they want pulled. Um, it, one of the things that 
gets hard about that, right, is that sometimes three people want to pull, pull the same bill. So Chris has to send another email out and say, your bill's already been pulled. Do you have another one? Your bill's already been pulled. Do you have another one? And it can take a little bit of time um, to go. I think we'll be doing more, um, more in-person polls um, uh, this time uh, or this next session than last session, because we'll be mostly in person. So I don't, I don't even know if that's answering the questions you all have about rules, but I'll stop there. I could go into many, many other layers of detail, but I think that gives you the high points. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And actually, I think the one burning question that I'm getting from lots of folks is, will session uh, be in person or virtual? And I think you just said you're expecting most of it to be in person. Yeah, uh, so I think um, what we are, um, uh, we will do hybrid uh, committee hearings. So people will be able to testify either remotely or in person. We're working on some best practices for committee chairs in doing, in doing that. So that'll be shared with folks once we work that through. Session itself, members will be expected to be there in person, so you won't have to testify in person, but we're expecting members to be there in person. We're kind of trying to hold down two ends of the spectrum here. You will be in person, on the floor, in committee hearings, if you want to vote, unless you are sick in any way, shape, or form. If you are ill, you're not to come to campus at all, and we will, uh, if you're well enough to vote, and to attend a committee hearing, even though you're ill, will we'll allow you to be there remotely. So we know that with the number of people that are gonna be on campus, we are likely to have COVID outbreaks and flu outbreaks. Uh, we wanna minimize that to the extent we can and be as safe and healthy as possible, but it's time for us to do whatever we can to, to be in person. Well, thank you so much, Representative Jenkins. We really appreciate your support in our community and your time here this morning and your dedication to figuring out how to make the world work um, in this new reality. Thank you so much for your commitment to us. Thank you for uh, uh, for having me. And uh, also, I just want to do a quick shout out. Um, thank you for working so heavily with um, uh, Jamila, uh, Representative Taylor. Uh, who has worked on a lot of issues, a lot of DD issues, and has really become a leader in our caucus on this. And I know that we'll have other new members coming in who will uh, exercise a lot of leadership. So it's exciting uh, to be able to move forward um, and pull uh, some important policy across the finish line here. Thank you. Our pleasure, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll hand the ball back over to Stacy. Thanks again, Speaker Jenkins, for taking time out of your work day. Thanks. Um, Okay, uh, Representative Gregerson, I think that you're here. Um, we just want to welcome you, and um, I'll let everybody know that Representative Gregerson comes to us from the 33rd Legislative District and is Vice Chair of both House Appropriations Committee and House Members of Color Caucus. She prides herself on representing one of the most racially diverse districts in the state. Um, we, we really look forward to um, Representative Gregerson um, helping us look at some of our issues through a, an equity lens. Um, Representative Gregerson, are you here? Give you just a minute to introduce yourself. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me to be in this space today. It's great to see some uh, friendly faces, those that are actually neighbors. <laughs> so hello, neighbors. <laughs> um, I, um, I'm excited to talk a little bit about the budget. I'll do, it, I'll do my very best to do it in a way that's not boring. <laughs> um, and I'm very visual, so I'll try to talk in a way that will help be helpful in sort of these bigger concepts rather than details. Um, and I'm happy to leave my contact information to have an offline group conversation or conversation about the details um, later. And I do believe that some of the other uh, more specifics of the budget will come out through your other speakers throughout the day. So you may not hear everything. So I think the, the best way for me to start is thinking Thinking about um, what government does, right? Government is just people. There's about 160, or excuse me, 132 agencies um, that work underneath the, the governor's um, uh, budget, right? And you heard already that they come forward with their decision packages. They've been doing that already. The governor will release his budget much before um, any either the House or the Senate will release their versions of the budgets. Um, and, and so that gives us a, a way to understand sort of what, what he's seeing, where his priorities are, where their priorities are. Um, we have a short year and a long year, and that's because of the bi biennial 
budget. So this coming year will be 105 days. We always start the second Monday of January and then you count the days out. Um, and so this will be the first year of that biannual budget. Uh, and then next year will be a supplemental budget. So just 60 days, we still start at the same time of the year, but only go for about half the time. Um, the other part is that when we're crafting a budget, we have to have a four-year outlook. I'm very happy to say that we had a very um, large budget these last few years because of the federal dollars, uh, but we also continued our AAA rating for bonding. We had uh, over $3 billion in our reserve, so a very good reserve, knowing that we had infl inflation issues, uncertainty around the pandemic, um, uneven recovery, uh, and then, of course, having federal dollars coming in, how do we use our state dollars to supplement in ways that the federal dollars don't allow us to? And I know many of you are very familiar with that. But that means that we can be smart on making sure that we make our dollars go as far as they can. Um, this, uh, the other part is we do look at caseloads. I know you're going to hear from others about caseloads and how um, that's actually a really big part of our budget that we don't actually make a ton of decisions about because it's already in the maintenance, right? We're already committed to funding those things. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop a couple PDF links for you so you can take a look at whether it's basic definitions, the difference um, in the different budgets, whether it's the revenue side of the budget. Um, if you're talking to our counterparts in the Senate, right? they have committee structure. You heard about the speaker talking about committee structure. It's a little bit different. In the House, we have the preparation side, which I'm the vice chair of, and then we work with our finance committee um, to deal with the right with the expenditures, and then of course the revenue side. In the Senate, they do it all in one committee. The other difference is that, or similarities too, is there's three budgets, right? There's the capital budget, and those are the things that you can touch. So oftentimes it's buildings, it's um, you know benches, and. <laughs> um, um, other things that you can actually see and touch. That doesn't mean that the operation budget, the one that I'm talking about, doesn't help with the maintenance of it or the people, the staffing issues or the programs. So that's how I kind of see the difference between the two different budgets. Um, and then the third budget is the transportation budget. And it's, and so if you're looking at total dollars and cents, um, the operating budget was Oh, $60 billion. It's the biggest budget we'd had. We're over a thousand pages, lots of information in there, and actually a lot of provisos. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, when it comes to the capital budget, it was only 1.5 billion. Still a lot, a lot in, for a historic, it was actually a historic budget when it came to the amount of funding. Um, and then the transportation budget structured differently. It relies on a lot of bonds. Um, and it was $11.7 billion over 16 years. So you can see they all have their own sort of way of doing their work, but they all need to complement each other because Washingtonians are moving all around. They need to safe, be able to do that safely. They also need to be able to have access points. And it's only fair that everyone um, is able to do that through the lens of equity. So talking a little bit about um, the provisos. I know that was something that folks wanted to hear about today. And so you, you heard from the speaker about bills and not all bills go through and each member, right? We're sort of like an independent contractor. So we can draft and work on projects and policy that doesn't have anything to do with maybe the bigger picture or advocacy groups. Um, and so then it's about which policy bills um, are going to make it all the way through, make it through. But sometimes there's great parts of those bills, whether it's policy or the fiscal side of things, or just ideas back in your own community um, that uh, is just a way to help provide funding um, and formalize that idea in a way that allows to use some of the state dollars to work on that over the next year. A lot of times it results in a report or some sort of feedback that can then help especially if your bill didn't go very far or you ran into some issues that need a little bit of time or community advocacy work to understand where maybe even a better idea of that project can come forward. So um, I think that's the best way to talk about provisos. And I think I'll just step back and see, I think if there's any questions or. Yeah, oh, and Rep Representative Gregerson, thank you so much. I feel bad the interpreters have been begging us in the chat for 
for everybody to slow down just a oh. tiny bit. And I had, didn't see that. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just say that and I'll do it myself because I'm as guilty as anyone. Um, I wanted to let you know that from our community, uh, DDA has put out almost 22 legislative reports just for this session coming up. And so you're going to see a lot of reports coming your way about the needs in our community. Um, in particular, we want to make sure you see uh, rate studies and information about housing. Uh, in the capital budget, you're going to see a lot of um, attention this session around housing that's appropriate for people with developmental disabilities. Um, and that'll feel like a really big number for you <laughs> um, when you look at it through an appropriations lens um, and a finance lens. But just keep in mind that uh, we have not significantly invested in housing since the 80s. You've been great about a three to five million set aside, but we're we're asking to to look more significantly at a big jump in that housing since we're not covered in the homelessness or behavioral health housing efforts uh, um, really adequately. It just does not meet our needs. And then in the operating budget side, you're going to see um, a lot of discussion and conversation about uh, first that maintenance level that you talked about. Um, somehow our maintenance level has been slipping. Uh, in addition, we have been asking about caseload forecasting. So you know that in our state, we try to highlight and prioritize the needs of pretty vulnerable groups um, in our community and include that in caseload forecasting. And, and most people are shocked to learn that developmental disabilities is never included in the caseload forecast um, solidly. So we do have a couple of services transition for high school students as a courtesy forecast. Um, and then of course our uh, personal care services, CFC services. Um, but that does not cover the, the, the rest of the really critical services that people with developmental disabilities need. So since you, you're, you're on these budget committees, I wanted to highlight that for you. In addition on transportation, this is always hard to get at the state level. Um, if you spent uh, five minutes with a number of people here, even in this room and talked about access and how um, well that may or may not be working for people as we ensure that public transportation meets the needs of people with disabilities, um, you know, we'd love to, to brainstorm with you how we try to connect the dots around increased um, access to public transportation and making sure that it works for people with disabilities. So I'm really grateful for your perspective on that. Um, I, I know that um, in, in terms of budget, you were great about telling us about provisos. Um, I'm curious, so you have to look at what's already planned for in the budget. And then when all the bills pass and you look at uh, provisos within the budget, you have to do this adjustment. <laughs> Do you, is there um, anything that you want us to know about how that comes together at the end? It's a lot like sausage. Yeah. And that's what you'll hear a lot. <laughs> and uh, I know Senator Warnick's here too, and I'm sure she'll say, uh, you know, she might have a few words to say. She's talking about her caucus, right? And how um, we're a big family and, and we're not a monolith. Um, and I think that speaks the same when it comes to whether it's the governor's ideas or the Senate's ideas or the House's ideas. Um, and thank goodness there's a cutoff calendar. Um, and again, I will put that in, in the chat later too, so you can look that up. But um, we usually work backwards from that cutoff. So we do our work, do our work. We have to negotiate. We have to come up with a, a proposal that's actually legal, doable, um, and um, is negotiated then. So we'll take the governor's budget, take a look at that, draft our own. Depending on the year, um, either the Senate or the House will come out with their budget first lob it over to the other chamber and then we start to negotiate. There are bills that are called NTIB, which are not, they're basically necessary to implement the budget, which means those bills don't have the same cutoff. Um, and I, I can't, I, one that comes to mind really quickly is like the working families tax credit. I think that was one example. The good part about it is it just gives us more time to have public hearings, talk about the issue and make sure that actually as it's dialed, right? Like all of these bills are dialed. Um, that still works with some of the ways that we had anticipated in the budget document so that, again, they're paired more closely. Um, so, uh, and again, as the speaker talked about, staff are the brain power of this work. 
um, we tend to be more lofty and then we're told by um, the experts how that actually um, relates when it's actually implemented. So thank goodness for really smart staff. And again, um, the more diverse those ideas and voices are, regardless of the process and where it's at, the better the product is at the end, because again, government is just people. Thank you so much. We are so grateful for your presence in the legislature um, and your time here today. Uh, we hope that you'll stay and you've been a great lead in to our next uh, speaker. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Brandy. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce Senator Judy Warnock, Judy Warnock, who covers the 13th legislative district. So that's Easton, Cleelum, uh, Moses Lake, Davenport. Um, she is the Republican caucus chair, like we've just talked about. She also is a small business owner. And I have heard that she appreciates the smiley faces on the chart that the ARC and the DDC put out uh, during every legislative session to understand our issues choose better. So um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your work on the budget committee um, and welcome. And I, you are still muted there. I, I never get over. <laughs> <laughs> I never get over that uh, remembering to unmute. But and what's been years, it seems like. So hopefully we'll be more in uh, in session. But I do come from uh, my office in Moses Lake, and uh, so it's it's helpful to have uh, this technology. But I want to thank Ark for inviting me today, and especially Diana Staden. And yes, I do like her smiley faces that she uh, puts out on the reports. It really is helpful. So. Um, you know, and I want to thank uh, the uh, person who put the map um, regarding the tribal lands on the chat. Um, I know that I represent lands of the Yakima and the Wanapum, but it was very nice to have that put out in a map. I, I have not seen that. So, and as uh, she said, as Brandy said, I am caucus chair for the Republicans in the Washington Senate. Um, so what's a caucus? Um, I thought I'd look it up and see what a, what that the definition is, but it kind of goes all over the place. But basically, a caucus is a gathering of uh, people who support specific political parties or ideas or movements. And in the political process, um, it starts on a local basis where people will meet and choose candidates to run for office. Uh, so it's a local caucus, caucus. And then once people are elected, uh, usually the caucuses, um, we have uh, very few uh, actual independents in the legislature, but the, the caucuses break down to Republican or Democrat. And that is because we generally have common legislative objectives, goals, um, and ideas. Um, as the speaker said, the majority caucus is generally the person, the uh, group that uh, puts forth the uh, nomination for the speaker of the house, and then it is voted by the entire uh, house. So, and that's not quite the way it, it works in the Senate, but. Um, so having a majority in the caucuses is, is very critical. We just went through an election. We're still trying to figure out who exactly is going to have the majority uh, in the caucuses, but um, it likely will be similar to what we've had in the, uh, in the past few years. Um, we're governed in our caucus by a set of rules, just like the Senate is is governed by a set of rules. And that's primarily to um, encourage discussions, but also encourage respect for each other, uh, encourage decorum, um, because we do have a lot of different ideas um, and different uh, viewpoints. So we meet as a caucus, most of the meetings um, of the, uh, the political caucuses mm -hmm are closed meetings. So it's just the caucus members and uh, some of our staff. And that's where we discuss priorities, we discuss policies, and we discuss the bills that we want to present as caucus members and discuss bills that the other uh, caucus 
uh, members are presenting. I work very closely with the Senate uh, Democrat Caucus Chair, Senator Hasegawa, uh, and as far as when we're going to meet and how long we're going to meet. So um, it, it does require a certain amount of working with, with each other, but um, it uh, caucuses also help us learn about our uh, members' interests uh, and um, skills. We have people from all over the state. We might not know that person until uh, they are elected to represent their districts and we don't know their interests, we don't know their skills. And so it helps us to meet as a caucus and discuss um, ideas. Um, and in order, uh, as the speaker said, we have different committees. Um, and if you know that someone is interested in healthcare, for example, it's easy uh, once you meet with them in a caucus to say that person should go on the, the healthcare committee. So it, it's very important for us to be able to meet, discuss our ideas and our policies. Um, and also uh, Representative Gregerson, when they introduced her, they said that she was a member of the House Members of Color Caucus. So we have some unofficial caucuses as well. Um, and I'm on a couple of those. I'm not chair of those committees or the caucuses, but the rail committee or rail caucus. We're interested in railroad policy, outdoor recreation caucus. Uh, we could have a Hispanic caucus. We're getting more and more Hispanic members. And then um, I, because I'm a farmer by trade too, and I am on the ag committee, we also meet um, often with agricultural interests. So unofficial caucuses um, also um, are present in Olympia. Those are outside of, of the actual committee hearings and at actual Senate floor meetings, but it gives people of uh, interest uh, and political parties a chance to discuss. And, you know, the un unofficial caucuses quite often are made up of people from both sides of of the political aisle, both sides of the political spectrum. So it gives us a chance to, to be more engaged in specific ideas. But I'm very, very glad to, to meet with you folks. Uh, very glad to um, let you know what we do in a caucus. It's not secretive. It's just gives, because it's closed door, it sounds like it might be secretive, but it gives us a chance to talk among each other about our policies and our priorities. So I'd be glad to, um, to answer any questions. I know there's going to be a break after this, but I, I also have a job just like uh, Revers, or Speaker Jenkins. So I'm taking some time out from that. So I'm going to uh, um, take time to answer questions. Thank you for inviting me. And um, then I'm gonna have to go about my day as well. And unfortunately, I'm gonna miss Rep Benke's speech and Speaker Chop, or former Speaker Chop. So, um, so be glad to answer any questions that you might Thank have. Thank you, Senator Warnick. That was great. And um, there has been lots of talk as you may know about a DD caucus mm -hmm. um, and um, and also um, a lot of talk recently about bipartisanship and how important yep. it is. Um, so I just want to uh, ask, do you have anything more to say about the DD caucus or bipartisanship with, with regard to this upcoming legislative session? Well, I hope we can do uh, uh, more on both of those. Um, I think a DD caucus would be very beneficial for those of us that uh, need to learn more about your community, learn more about your needs. I already heard about the housing needs and I am on the um, local government and housing committee. So um, I think it would be very, very helpful. Uh, the bipartisanness of uh, our discussions, I think is critical. Um, it, it is absolutely critical. Our people, and I have been told this over and over from my district, our people want us to go over and talk to each other. They don't want us to just go over and fight. So that's that's always been my goal is to talk to each other, find out what, what uh, 
uh, reasoning is for for different policies and different uh, votes that they take. So that's that's always been my my goal is to talk to people. Thank you. Thank you so much. And listen. And, and listen. listen. <laughs> that's the biggest part too is listening. So so thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I hand back over to Stacy. Thank you. And thank you again, Senator Bornick. Um, we always value your perspective and appreciate your words. Um, okay, well, at this point, I think we'd like, would like to uh, welcome Representative Frank Chop. I think he's here in the room. Um, and just to introduce you, Representative Chop, to everybody, um, you come to us from the 43rd Legislative District, and you were our Speaker of the House for over 20 years working on critical human issues like low-income housing, homelessness, child care, affordability and access, and addressing equity and poverty issues. We, we always really value your involvement um, in trying to solve our lengthy and complex social justice issues here in the world of developmental disabilities. So welcome. Um, I, I wonder if you wanna come on and say a few words um, before you've got a few questions to answer. Yeah, that's uh, great. Uh, can you hear me okay, Stacy? Yeah, we, sound, oh, we can hear you. Well, it's a great honor to follow uh, Judy Warnick, by, by the way. I'm glad you had her on there. And also, I think Mia Gregerson was just on here as well. Uh, so I feel honored to be part of that group uh, that you've lined up, but also be invited to talk to you today and answer a few questions if you have some. So um, I thought I'd uh, speak for a few minutes and then I guess uh, open for question and answers if that's the format you want. So I was um, asked to speak about the importance of caseload forecasting. <laughs> it sounds a little dry, doesn't it? But when you get down to it, it's, it's real people, uh, real people uh, needing important services so they can live in the community. And I know uh, personally of people in my family who would uh, that rely on this kind of thing or could rely on it, as well as I know all of you care about these kinds of services. So folks, uh, can live in the community. So um, the, the point about this thing is to make sure we use the caseload forecasting in, in order to uh, do the uh, correct planning as we look forward about how we can fund uh, the services. So it's not just a, a thing in writing, it's actual funding for services that people need. Um, and the services and support uh, to um, which you are, I'm sure, uh, familiar on in terms of living in the community. So. That's one thing is the caseload forecast where essentially the government and currently there is a process going on right now for a caseload forecast. I'm not sure if Stacy or others mentioned that, but the um, state government will release a caseload forecast for those set of services for uh, this community. I don't know what it's going to say yet. They don't give me an advanced copy, uh, <clears throat> you know, but uh, it uh, should be extensive, but we really need you to pay attention to what they actually forecast to make sure they're actually doing the right thing. Hate to bring it to you, but you got to always monitor government. Otherwise, they'll go sideways. You got to monitor them to make sure they keep doing the right thing uh, to serve the community and also make sure we have a, a solid foundation for recommend recommending that whatever services are part of the caseload forecast and are justified that we in fact will then fund them. It's, it's one thing to say, yes, if you had this uh, set of uh, caseloads, this is what it would cost. That's the caseload forecast. Now we then have to make sure uh, that they get funded, which is why you're all here is uh, on this advocacy effort. Your advocacy is extremely important. And I've worked with coalitions like this across the board for years uh, bringing people together in order to do the right thing for people. But we have to work together to make sure the advocacy is coordinated and very extensive. And it's great that the bipartisanship was mentioned uh, by others. Uh, we clearly think there's opportunities for bipartisanship on this kind of issue. The other thing, though, that I would encourage bipartisanship is to make these services an entitlement. Now, some people get uh, agitated when you use the word entitlement. Well, if there ever was a need for making government services or community services rather uh, an entitlement, this is it. Okay. So let me give you two other examples of entitlement of services. The first one you're probably uh, well aware of. Years ago, I helped organize the home care program to um, get created in the state and then also to um, make sure that it was well funded. 
So guess what? The home care for people with disabilities um, is an entitlement. It's a Medicaid entitlement. Same thing with this, by the way. Uh, if we make the set of community services an entitlement, uh, it will also uh, trigger or leverage, shall we say, federal money. Uh, for every dollar we put in, the feds will match that. That's really important because we've done that consistently, including in the home care program going back over oh, 20 years. And now, as a result of that entitlement and their investment from the state, the home care program for people with disabilities is uh, either, I think it's the best in the nation, I mean, maybe it's number two, whatever, <laughs> it's way up there because we made an entitlement and then funded it. And that goes to pay the workers and provide the training, uh, some health benefits, things like that, some really you know, common sense things to help the workers provide the actual services. The other entitlement, which, which you may not be aware of, although I, I see a lot of friends here and I, I think maybe Joe Cunningham knows this. Hi, Joe, good to see you. Um, is the um, one that we passed uh, in 2019. It was called the Workforce Education Investment Act. And what that did, it did raise some revenue uh, in a logical way, but it raised uh, about a billion dollars over four years. And the main purpose of that is to make free college and university tuition available to all low-income students, okay? Now, national leaders talk about free college. Well, we actually did it and we're helping the uh, low-income people the best, uh, the first. And so again, that's free college and university tuition for all low-income students going to the University of Washington or community college, and we made it an entitlement. So my point to you is that not only will this entitlement trigger a federal Medicaid match, we always like to get more money into the state, right? But I think you're just as important as any University of Washington student. When you think about it, why should they get an entitlement uh, that goes up to 11,000 bucks per person per year at the University of Washington, which by the way, I, I went to the university, so I, I'm not complaining, but the point is, is that, uh, you know, it's good enough for them, it's good enough for you. And so keep that in mind when you're thinking about advocating for this, you're advocating for the right thing, the thing that the people of our state need and the people of our state will support because of the, the need and, and who you represent and how you do advocacy. So uh, I hope it didn't go too long there. Is that- uh, It did not go too long. Couple? And you know, uh, I love hearing you talk right now. This has been a, a wonderful um, bit of information and insight that you provide us. And and, and I just wanna reiterate a couple of really important things that you said that, you know, caseload forecasting, it, it, it sounds kind of wonky, but it's just a planning tool uh, and it signals to the legislature, you know, this is a priority human service that we really have to pay attention to. Um, but we have to not only adopt the plan, we have to carry out the plan to action. That's the other thing. By the way, I, I should have added also that this is one of four things I'm working with Stacy and a whole bunch of the rest of you uh, in an uh, agenda to help uh, people with uh, disabilities, uh, including housing for people with disabilities, um, also uh, helping the workforce because we need more workers who are trained. Um, and other things as well. So it's it's one part of a four part agenda that we want to move forward together through the next legislative yeah. session. And my partner in this effort, uh, including some of the folks that are here today, is also Representative Jamila Taylor from the 30th District. And uh, she uh, is going to get reelected. So uh, that that'll help, obviously, because she really is committed to this and has uh, family members that would benefit. Uh, from this kind of investment. So that was the end of my little spiel there, Stacey. I hope I oh, didn't go I'm, too long. I'm so excited to hear you because, you know, we spent the summer talking with legislators about this kind of three-legged stool. We need a brick and mortar housing, residential services, and workforce. And all those three parts are a little bit broken in our world and we need your help to shore those up and make them all work together for sure. Um, and so I, I love that you're saying that. Um, I wanted to say one thing about the courtesy caseload forecast that you all are going to see kind of any day now. What to do? Um, you know that language was limited to a request list, which is kind of a subset of all the people who are eligible for DDA services. And we're a little bit worried that it won't reflect the total need, uh, but we're hopeful that uh, the caseload forecast council took seriously the focus on residential services um, and what that means. We may need your help to sort out. Um, does the caseload forecast forecast people 
or services? Does it help you monetize um, the cost of services that support the actual people that are eligible? I mean, how do we tweak that a little bit so we get closer to giving you reliable data about our needs so that you can do your work and connect it to dollars? Um, so just a heads up about that. And I wanted to also reiterate your great comment that you know we can't forget all of our services come with a federal match. Uh, and that's, you know, that gives us so much more lift when it comes to the state's commitment. Sorry to, so, sorry to interrupt, but I have a question for Frank Chop, just really quick. Um, what are you going to do about um, supporting and shutting down the state all right, seeds in our state, Chop? Uh, uh, Eric, thank you. Um, Representative Chop, I'm sure, would be happy to answer that question. And yeah. you wouldn't mind, please, yeah, put that on you. Uh, thanks, Eric. Appreciate your uh, question. I think it's time for us to all come together and recognize that we need to move folks into the community. Uh, the state institutions uh, were a solution for many years, including my uncle Eddie, who was in Fircrest and also Buckley Rainier School for decades. Um, at that time, my family needed that access to care for them. But times have changed and also um, government has changed. Uh, when the government can't adequately keep up those institutions, we need to figure out some better alternative in the community. So. What my concern, but I, I think we can get through this, is that if we in fact um, uh, uh, ramp down or close eventually these state institutions, I just wanna make sure that the people have a place to live, okay? Because I you know, started going into the details, but when we closed Francis Haddon Morgan Center, uh, we closed it down and there was a set of criteria that they had to, to ensure care for the individual. Uh, and then within a, uh, a few weeks, uh, somebody died, okay? So we need to have really good housing and really good support services and really good agencies to run those programs in the community. So that's part of the equation uh, because uh, we need to do the right thing. And I believe that we have the understanding now uh, to go forward. That's why I'm working with Stacy and many of the rest of you to figure out that four part strategy. And the, one of the four parts is in fact, housing in the community for people uh, in, in this group here in terms of the IDD. Uh, but it, 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 you can pass a law, you can shut down a state institution, but unless you implement it correctly, people can suffer. And I, that's what I'm most concerned about is make sure we get people housed in decent places with support services and that they can thrive in the community. Thank you, Representative Chong. That was a really thoughtful response to that, that tricky question sometimes. And we, we appreciate your view about that. Um, well, I, I want to thank you. You're right on track, right on time, uh, wonderful information, and we're really grateful you took time out of your day to come be with us today. Yeah, we uh, yeah thank you very much, Stacey. Really appreciate it. Uh, I got the next thing to get to, so I, I won't stick around, but uh, we're, we're in contact, so we're, we're working uh, every week together. So thanks very much. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right, and I will pass it on to Brandy for our next guest. Great. Thank you. Stacey, I'm just going to do a quick check and make sure my internet is sh pretty shaky. Are you able to hear me right now? Yeah, we can hear you great. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, and th thank you so much, um, uh, Representative Chop, for your time with us today. All right, it is my pleasure to now introduce uh, Representative Matt Banky. Uh, I'm going to check and make sure he is here. Great, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Banky serves the 8th Legislative District, so that area is around the Tri-Cities area. Uh, he is an Army veteran and also the ranking minority member of the Community and Economic Development Committee. He is very involved with his constituents um, who have developmental disabilities and their families in his communities. And um, I hear, I have heard about all kinds of events that he has attended um, and work he has done in his community. Um, and I also want to stop for just a moment and um, congratulate you on your win, um, because uh, we will soon have Senator Banky um, instead of Representative Banky. So uh, congratulations and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Brandy. You are too kind. And uh, I'm just honored and privileged to be a part of this team. And thanks for the invite and having me out to speak a little bit on what I think you have as one of the uh, superstars of the lineups of uh, between the House and the Senate. and. Appreciate your kind words. I'm a little sleepy from a late night last night of uh, 
really kind of an exciting time in our lives. So I appreciate the kind words and looking forward to working with you as we transition from the House over to the Senate. Uh, today, you guys have asked me to, to work a little bit more as we're advocacy toward committee days and what really committee days is and how that's set up, what it really means, who attends, and what you guys can do to manufacture or even maximize the efforts when you're on the Hill, as we call it, during these committee days. So what are committee days? Committee days usually convene in a, and this year it's going to be in a hybrid format. So we allow people to be on campus, but then if you can't make that, they'll be virtual. I, uh, every committee will have an opportunity to go ahead and log in. You can do it like we're doing here through a Zoom session as well as others, uh, both in the House and the Senate. Uh, between each one of those, we have committees that are out there, and I'll put in the chat which committees are available. Like you mentioned before, I'm a ranking member on the House um, Community Economic Development Committee. There it is in the chat. Also on the Energy and Environment, um, Transportation, and the Appropriations Committee. As we transition, you're going to see a lot of that from the House and Senate. Some have different terminologies, but they do pretty much same thing from the House and Senate. And we work those types of bills that are in and impacting um, the DD community. Typically during assembly days, also provide an opportunity for you and also the members that are on this call and others who may not have made it to really meet with other members, grab us in the hallway, talk to us if you can. Um, we can stop outside of our offices. I always enjoy that. I'm looking forward to getting back in person and seeing each and every one of you as staying health and uh, happy that we can see, see your bright smiley faces to really understand the stories and the impacts that when you mention workforce, housing, residential services, things that impact the DD community across the state, um, really understand that. And it means a lot to really get to know you and connect again. I believe a lot of times we need to build relationships. Um, in the last couple of years, we've all been kind of torn apart, whether it's just on screens and others, that it's about building relationships again, about caring for individuals, about really understanding where everybody comes from and allowing your voice to be heard is a big part of committee days. Um, we have agenda set up there. And if you have not seen that, you can click through the link on in the chat about the legislative committees. They're broken down by each committee, but you can also, I wanted to put in there as well, the um, calendar. So one of the good things of being, um, I'm kind of one of the geeks of the house. Uh, I have a cyber background, being the military, I flew helicopters, jumped out of airplanes, but I also work in cybersecurity. So helping secure our internet and having a really vibrant website. We have a lot of really great people that can duck those information sharing on our website. So click on the link. You can sign up for the calendars of those that you feel is going to be pertinent. And as part of the advocacy, one of the big steps is really having that one pager that we've been talking about. I know I've been meeting with the 8th District, 16th, 15th down here in the Tri-Cities. We've been working on workforce development issues, the uh, housing issues you brought up, Brandy, and others, as well as the residential services that are impacting our community here in the Tri-Cities, but also around the, um, the state of Washington. And, and that means a lot to us to have those goals clearly laid out and to especially new members that are coming on board. And, and the second step I always remind people is when you're coming into committee days or even any kind of advocacy, build that coalition that let us know who else is signing on, who's running the bills, who are really kind of the champions that you've seen. I, I feel like I'm a champion. I still feel like I need to earn the respect of your community each and every day and the, the families that are impacted in our Tri-City area. And it means a lot to me to um, not take that word lightly, to have that champion moniker that says, you've come and you've entrusted us as elected officials to lead these efforts across the state, in the Senate, in the House, toward a common goal. And that's where we can build a coalition of like-minded individuals and what uh, uh, Representative Chop um, and others, I've worked in bipartisan and joint legislative committees with uh, Mia Gregerson, Frank Chop, um, Warnick, uh, others that you've had on the call have been friends of mine for years now. And it's really great to get to know them, their families. And as we work together, we have a lot more in common than people realize or that you read in the news um, or you see on TV, frankly. Um, so it's coming together with that, building that coalition, and then having that plan of really focusing on the policies that we want to impact the best, where that RCW is, where we can make sure we're hitting 
the right tone that we need to, but also taking that action that you want us to do. Our goal is we want to be elected people, but we also want to take action. We're all that same kind of fire in our belly. We're engaged in our communities. We want to be problem solvers. And I believe when you hear from each and every one of us, we represent a lot of the others across the state that have the same kind of advocacy, same kind of fire passion that we have as well. Um, back to the assembly days, all the hearings are and will be streamed live on TVW. Hopefully you have the link to TVW.org as well as signing up on there. You can see it as you get into that. I tell people in our uh, localities across, especially in rural Eastern Washington, don't want to travel in the crazy winter weather. You can then link in. You can find a way that we can do that. And uh, this year we're kicking it off at the end of November on the 28th. Then it goes through the December 2nd. A lot of those are tailored to new incoming uh, members who just got recently elected doing that on Monday and Tuesday. We kind of do administrative stuff, but toward the end of the week, we'll have the joint environments around Wednesday, it looks like, and then the other committees be Thursday and Friday. Each day there gives you an opportunity within those to really grab members to bring us together and kind of see where it's at. And I call that, it's a military kind of mindset. It's a target of opportunity for us to meet with you but also a target opportunity for you to meet with us and just re-emphasize some of those things that we've met during the interim throughout the year. But as we prepare for the session, these are really critical times that we'd love to hear from you. So does that kind of help uh, lead the discussion today is what you're looking for about prepping for committee days? Yes, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for the fire in your belly. Uh, you are <laughs> in a room full of bellies on fire. So we appreciate your time and uh, your perspective on committee committee days. And we are super excited to work with you as Senator Banky in the future. Thanks so much. I'm humbled, uh, honored. Uh, it's a big event for our family, of course, in our community. But yeah, it's humbling to follow in the footsteps of Senator Brown. A lot of the effort she's doing, I'm going to just continue the same thing. Uh, it's not rocket science when it's really down to earth of just looking in each and everybody that's on this call and others that you just want to do the best you can while you you're here and we want to you know be solvers of problems that are in our community so yeah is there any questions I can I don't know if I got a couple more minutes or a little bit of time if I can answer any questions people have I think we're going to pass the ball along because we are running I believe a bit behind schedule okay so I will go ahead and hand it back over to Stacey Dan oh, and thank you again Senator Binky for coming we just enjoy hearing from you so much Thank you as well. Appreciate you guys. Take care. Yeah. Got to run. Get some rest. Thanks. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> okay. Our next speaker, I'm super excited to introduce uh, Senator Trudeau. Uh, Senator Trudeau um, is here with us from Pierce County and Tacoma, in particular, the 27th Legislative District. She is the former legislative aide to Pramila Jayapal. She was an analyst for the Senate Democratic Caucus. Uh, she was the legislative director for the Attorney General's Office. Um, and I have to say personally, I will never forget Senator Trudeau's announcement as a new senator when she said to all of us, trust your struggle. I actually wrote it on a sticky note and I put it next to my desk um, and it inspires me on a regular basis. So Senator Trudeau, welcome. And most importantly, how's your new baby? Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate that. I'm just <laughs> letting that sit with me for a second. Um, and, and just, I, I'm in this moment um, feeling very affirmed today and very tired and my baby is too because she did allow me to actually have a little bit of time away from her last night and we're both recovering from it. Um, but as, as Stacey mentioned, for, for those of you that don't know, uh, you know, Yasmin Trudeau, I was uh, unanimously appointed to the state Senate last November when Senator Jeannie Darniel uh, announced that she was stepping down, which man, you wanna talk about big shoes, right? It's, uh, I, I decided I was gonna go for it, went for it last night, the voters affirmed me um, that's all I'll say about that. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. And it would have been really awkward to be scheduled to speak today if that wouldn't have happened. So hallelujah, it's <laughs> perfectly timed. Um, but I also found out six days after the appointment that I was pregnant um, and, and you know, obviously made the choice to keep my, keep my child. I love her. Uh, she's doing great, but uh, it's presented many challenges um, over this summer. So it's wonderful to be seen and be in this space with you. And I have a lot to be grateful for um, in this moment, but I don't know, Stacey, do you want me to kind of, do you, are you, do you want to moderate, prompt me? Do you want me to kind of go to- I can prompt you, you um, and and feel free to just 
just you know extrapolate on this. We know that you have a family connection, a personal connection yeah. to developmental disabilities. Uh, some people don't know that. Maybe you could talk a little about a bit about that. Mm -hmm. I think the two big issues that um, Diane and I had framed for you were um, mm -hmm. issues around caregiving, the lack of a workforce, um, because many people have personal care and respite hours through DDA, but they're unable to get them because they can't find a provider. Um, and the others around parent providers. Our state allows parents to get paid as a caregiver for their adult son or daughter over 18. Mm -hmm. uh, but for, as you know, many working moms have to drop out of the workforce in order to care for their children with developmental disabilities. And they're assessed for hours for someone else to care for their child. Uh, but many parents are being vocal now about whether or not it makes sense to go ahead and allow them to be paid since they can't find childcare. Um, they're, they're really struggling. So if you could touch on those issues a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and I, I'll start by saying those issues are so relevant to me actually right now and in this moment. And I'll go into that a little bit, but you know, part of what made me decide that I wanted to to seek the seat, right, to have a platform to sort of put um, issues forward, was the professional experience that you mentioned. But truly, it's actually my lived experience that I wanted to have at the table because the professional experience, okay, fine, you know, you can sort of acquire that. But what I realized in conversations in Olympia is that that lived experience wasn't always there wasn't as a diverse set of lived experiences or perspectives that were in the rooms that were making decisions. And one of those experiences for me is having both a brother and a mother with disabilities, different disabilities. Um, you know, my brother was born with uh, cognitive and physical disabilities. He has cerebral palsy um, and a developmental mm -hmm. delay. Um, he is a fantastic, thriving, wonderful human being. Uh, and I actually, it helped, I moved back from California when I was 24. I was down there living the dream for about three years. And my mom, uh, when I was 23, was like, oh, well, we're having another baby, uh, which I thought was a, a, a big uh, aspiration. But uh, when we realized sort of at about a year old um, that my mother's disabilities were progressing and my brother's disabilities were um, starting to be tracked, I moved home. And so I actually have co-parented my brother uh, since he was about a year old. And that experience to me um, has been a life changer for, for many, many reasons. Um, you know, the way that I, I learn from Naeem every single day, my brother's name is Naeem. Um, but truthfully, what it's taught me is there, where I go, Naeem goes, right? And the world figures it out. And I think that that is something that for those of us that are allies to folks with disabilities, like we, our role is to create that space, right? For every person to be able to live their whole authentic self. And that's my goal with my brother. That's my goal with my mother. And that's my goal in the policy space is how do we create, you know, the opportunity for everybody to show up in the way that looks and feels right and safe for them. So that's how I interact with these issues and sort of what I, what I try to bring on, on all policy issues, but specifically um, related anywhere, anytime I can advocate for folks with disabilities. Many of you I've actually gotten to know over the years. I think Diana, uh, we had met um, back when I was working for Senator Jayapal and I just, you know, was trying to keep up. I had no idea that we would, that it would come like sort of full, full circle like this. So it's great to see you. Um, you know, I, the when we talk about the committees, or wait, let's talk about the workforce issue because that's actually relevant to what's happening. So my mom and my brother in the past month and a half have rotated through four caregivers in a month and a half. Now my mom requires care to help things like uh, filling out, you know, writing her bills, paperwork, things that I had been doing for a long time since I was a kid. Um, my brother's needs look very different. And the fact that we're not able to fire, and I consider myself a pretty sophisticated actor, right? I've reached out to the right folks. I've called the right agencies. I've, I've done everything that I feel like I have the capacity to do. And when that happens, it makes me reflect on, well, what happens when there are folks that don't know what agencies to call or don't know who to pick up the phone and get a hold of? It terrifies me that this is the situation that we're in. And in fact, it's gotten so bad um, that my brother is actually back living with me temporarily um, only because it, the two of them cannot live together without, their, without adequate care. So my brother's actually been back with me now um, for off and on for the past month and a half, but with me for the past week. And then I go and check on my mother regularly. She lives actually right down the street. But not having that care also means that my mom wasn't able to come to my election party, right? Like now she's, um, it, has, it has built up and she is actually on the couch, um, unable to move her left leg 
um, because she doesn't have somebody that that's coming in and doing what what she needs to get done. I can only, you know, having a new baby, having my brother. So I those it, it actually kind of makes me shake to talk about it. Um, because like I said, it's it's a terrifying prospect that there are other families out there uh, that don't have the privileges that that we have in my family now uh, to be able to care, well, to put together some kind of care plan for their folks. And I don't know what would what would be happening right now if I, I wasn't in this position. Um, you mentioned, I think you mentioned workforce, and then there was one other. Oh, the parent pay. Um, so yeah, I mean. I, I fully support that policy. I think any opportunity to make sure that folks have adequate care, whether that is a parent, whether that is somebody, you know, if the family chooses to have somebody from the outside, whatever it looks like to make, to open up that opportunity to give their family member, their loved one, the best care and opportunity that they want and deserve, that's what we should be doing. Um, so I think that's full stop how I feel about the parent pay bill. I think any, any opportunity, <laughs> if, if it's the parent, great, let's figure out how to do that. Because it's true, the brunt of a lot of issues do fall on, on moms and single moms. Um, but truly, any, any parent that wants the opportunity um, and, and their child wants the opportunity to have that person as their caregiver should be compensated for that work. Um, so we appreciate Santa, that. And you know, you're in such a unique role to be able to look at this through your own lens. And I, I too, I'm just taking in for a minute all the things that you just shared, um, because I know we're all moved in this room um, and and hear what you're saying. Many of us are, have experienced the same thing as a sibling myself. Um, I certainly have been in those situations. I'm also caring for my mom who has dementia. Um, and, you know, life life brings these situations that we have to bring to light um, because more of us than people realize are going through these kinds of struggles. Um, I think the difficulty for the legislature is always, you know, it comes down to dollars. It comes down to, are, are we gonna um, place these policies issues and these priorities and reflect our values in the budget commitments that we make? And I know we sound like a broken record, but uh, we have not been a priority for the state legislature. We're not caseload forecasted. We're not, we're still in, you know, the bottom 10 of the nation in funding toward developmental disabilities. Um, we have really critical policy issues that need to move forward. And what we find is there's always something a little uh, flashier. <laughs> and we all know it's important. Abortion, gun control, wildfires, saving the whales. Those are critical issues to our larger community. But what it means means is our issues often um, hit the back end of the session and the back end of the budget. Um, and we're not a lot of people, 170,000 people total, maybe, and only 50,000 people that are eligible right now under DDA. So our voice is not as loud as it and should be. So we appreciate that you're a voice there. Thank you, Stacey. And I, and you know, it's really interesting you talked about like some of the issues that sort of dominate the conversation, but we also know that at the intersections of that folks with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by all of those issues, right? As are as are many marginalized communities. Um, and so I, I never think of things in silos. And I really want the opportunity to talk about that when I when we get into these spaces. If we are talking about a, a policy issue, are we are we really thinking deeply about how these issues impact you know different communities and are we elevating that, right? And I think that's what I hope to do to make sure that we all stay a part of that and relevant to every policy conversation not just ones that are, you know, sort of, okay, well, this is this is the lane, right? To talk about uh, folks with disabilities. It's like, no, 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 every lane is that lane. So I, I really hope to do that. And I appreciate you um, trusting me to move those conversations forward. Well, we, we appreciate you and the, the time that you took today to come and share with us um, so honestly and, and knowing that you're gonna be there. This next legislative session gives us all a great deal of hope. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate it. Um, and, and so I think we're we're actually kind of just about right on time. Um, so I'll I'll thank you again for coming, and we'll forward any questions that come your way to you. And I'll turn it back over thank to Brandy. You. Thank you. Yes, and congrats. All right. So um, next up, we have Representative Peter Abarno. I just want to make sure we can see him. Ah. Uh, Representative Abarno serves the 20th Legislative District. So that area is uh, some of Thurston County, Lewis County, Cowlitz County, and um, the northern tip of Clark County. 
Uh, he is the assistant ranking member of the Capital Budget Committee, and he's here to help us understand the capital budget and how that relates to especially our housing crisis this year um, in the DD system. Um, he's also FYI a coach for the Lewis County Special Olympics um, and apparently took a polar plunge um, with some folks in Lewis County at the Icicle Brigade uh, to help raise money for that effort. Uh, so welcome, Representative Abarno. I see that he is actually in the waiting room again. And maybe that his audio is disconnected. Let's see here. Um, I just admitted him again. And it could be that he, got, he dropped off and is back in. Hello, Representative Abarna. Welcome. And then I think we need to make sure that he's made a co-host so that he can come on. There we go. <laughs> Can you hear me? There. Yes, now we can. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, sorry about that. I just got noticed that the legislative uh, website was updating my computer. Oh. So, <laughs> so, sorry. Okay. So you're going to get kind of an interesting uh, perspective, and I'll try not to move the camera too much. So great. Thank you so much for coming. I just was talking about, about your um, uh, relationship and activities in Lewis County with regard to um, the Special Olympics and apparently a polar plunge that you did to raise money. So thank you so much. And I know you're here to speak with us about um, the capital budget. Yeah. So first, I just want to thank you all for the invitation. Uh, you know, it was only a couple of weeks ago, I, I got to do the um, the opening, um, I guess, introductions to the um, the uh, Southwest Washington Autism Coalition um conference and you know i i always feel like those invitations um mean a lot to me as somebody who you know this is my first term uh on capital budget and in the legislature and it means a lot to me because it's kind of a recognition of the things that i've done in the community outside of being a legislator or a policymaker to me that means so much more to me um you know whether we're dealing with you know, ADA accessible sidewalks or whether we're dealing with playgrounds with true um, inclusion and accessibility. Those are things that I've worked on without really even thinking or even prior to even considering running for anything, any public office. You know, in the 20th district, which is Thurston County, Lewis, Collis and Clark, you know, being in the legislature is really great, giving me an opportunity to you know, expand some of those uh, passions I've have, which is, you know, a passion for a community that is completely and utterly unrepresented or, or underrepresented uh, in, in policymaking. Um, on capital budget, which I like to always call the happy budget, uh, because it's a budget that is about bonds. It's one of the three fiscal budgets, transportation, capital budget, and the operating budget. It's one of the, the budgets that's based on that you have to work together. Republicans need Democrats. Democrats need Republicans uh, to pass a capital budget because it's a bond budget and you need a supermajority. And so you truly see uh, solutions. You see investments rather than just expenditures. And one of the great opportunities of capital budget is to invest not just in housing, uh, but in infrastructure that can create housing or infrastructure that can improve the quality of life for residents throughout the state of Washington, including in the 20th district. And one of the things that I've tried to focus on over the last couple of years is how do I take um, my opportunity as the assistant ranking member on capital budget, which it gives me a great opportunity being in a lot of these negotiations, uh, but take that opportunity plus my passion for helping community members and 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 try to build on that. And I, I had heard in a previous presentation someone talking about Fircrest. Well, I sat through many committee meetings in capital budget because Fircrest uh, and some of the issues of Fircrest uh, come through uh, capital budget. And we talk about housing and housing opportunities and really driving these policies locally into the community. A lot of that comes through capital budget, whether it be direct allocation or through, you know, proviso budget language that says, you know, there's a greater opportunity to improve the quality of life uh, for our uh, 
com community members if we build true community housing and community opportunities rather than focusing on centralized uh, hospitals or centralized treatment centers or centralized you know buildings and so this has really given me a, a really awesome opportunity to meet with many of you who I've gotten to meet over the last two years um, to try to drive these policies to more community-based solutions, um, which in the long run helps not only uh, you, but family members and treatment providers and, and everyone else. Um, so um, for myself in, in the 20th district, you know, I love going to organizations like People First, the Reliable Enterprises, you know, Special Olympics. Um, here in Lewis County, um, over the last many years, I've organized uh, the uh, Polar Plunge to support Special Olympics. And my nine-year-old son and I, I run it every year, and he's finally at the age where I'm surprised he can do it. We do the, uh, the law enforcement torch run, uh, which is about a, a 15 to 20 mile run through Lewis County that raises money for Special Olympics. These are all great ways, I think, uh, that we can not just invest in our community privately and through philanthropic ways, but it helps me stay connected with the people that we're helping through capital budget. So, you know, I, I have spent uh, now, this will be my second term after last night, um, you know, last yesterday I was reelected. I, I did not have an opponent, so that was a, a much more easy election for me. But uh, I, I kind of look back, and someone asked me this morning, "Well, how does it feel?" I said, "Well, it feels kind of weird because I'm listening to you know uh, newly elected Senator Matt Banky talk about advocacy days. Well, I've never experienced an advocacy days because I was elected during COVID." So a lot of you have never had the opportunity to meet me in person uh, or sit down with me or, or advocate for your issues other than through the screen and other than through my local community that I, that I volunteer with and do a lot of uh, work with. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with you on, on not just the issues of capital budget. You know, capital budget deals with building. We build things. We build parks and recreation centers and, and, and as you heard, Furcrest and housing and infrastructure, but to work with you on all those other policy issues that kind of get interwoven with capital budget, um, like trying to focus more on community-based opportunities rather than merely uh, just uh, kind of these centralized locations, which we know don't do justice for for uh, for the uh, for your community or really any community. So, with that, um, I will you know take any questions and and apologize for my awkward uh, phone phone Zoom presentation. Hey, uh, Representative Barbara, this is Stacy Dim, and I, you look great for for one, especially just getting over election night. So we hope you get a little bit of rest today <laughs> um, and congratulations. You know, we have enjoyed a great relationship with you. Um, and uh, I know you're very passionate. You, you are connected to people with developmental disabilities in ways that make this work real for you. And we see that. And we also appreciate your, your value of bipartisan relationships. Uh, we just heard it and we see it in your commitment um, when you're working in Olympia and we're super grateful for that. You're in a unique position on the capital budget, uh, bringing the knowledge that you have on one of our premier issues, which is housing. <laughs> housing that meets the needs of people with developmental disabilities, which is unlike the efforts, the, the laudable efforts around homelessness and behavioral health housing. Um, it is also not the same as facilities. So. Um, we need crisis response and we need um, to make sure that we have a safety net for our folks that are in crisis. But we're just talking about everyday housing so that people can live in the community and not have to move um, from Grace Harbor to Yakima to get housing that meets their needs. And um, can, uh, you know, the seniors in your, in your community that are 70, 80 and 90 year olds still caring for their son or daughter with developmental disabilities have a way to plan for when they need care themselves or they're no longer here to care for their person. And housing is a major obstacle for those things to happen. 
Um, you know, we haven't invested in housing since deinstitutionalization in the 80s, where there was a big public referendum and we purchased a bunch of group homes at the time. You know, since that time, just in the last eight years or so, there's been three to five million at the in the DD housing set aside, housing trust fund set aside, which is great. But just think about those dollars. That's a few houses every biennium that um, houses between three and five people. Um, we're looking in this budget based on a couple of DD housing studies that you'll see um, a much more significant commitment. Um, so if you look at that referendum back then, that was about 162 million in today's dollars. <laughs> Can you even imagine? Um, so even if we asked you for 40 million, that's 10% of what Commerce is proposing and that would take a big chunk out of this. Um, and again, we've been kicking this can down the road like many things in developmental disability. So it feels like a lot right now, but it, it could mean a lot of the need and free up people to live in their own communities um, in these ways that I've described. So we hope you'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, well, session. and I most certainly will. And, and, and you know, I listened to Senator Trudeau talk a little bit about you know, her personal experience, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I relayed this story when I spoke to the Autism Coalition. I'm not old. But I'm old enough where when I went to middle school, um, I remember how um, our schools were really very segregated, where if you had even ADHD, you were separated into a new room and a different room, and there wasn't any interaction. It was kind of don't notice, don't see anything. There's nothing to see here. And I think we've made some amazing strides, but we have so much more to go to truly invest. And I I say this a lot to my colleagues is that there's expenditures and then there's investments. Investing in, in this community is a great investment that not only will have quality of life um, um, feedback, but will also have a cost savings. Um, this is a smart savings. This is something that we should be doing. Um, you know, I, I, again, I didn't grow up with, 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 Anyone in my household who had a disability that I knew of, my, my friends didn't. And as I, as I said, we were very segregated. But I made it a real point when I had my kids, uh, my daughter's 11, my son's nine, that I will do my darndest to make sure my kids never have to deal with this kind of segregation and that we're, we're truly inclusive and that we work with every single person in our community to invest in them and make sure their quality of life is better. And and I know from their experiences with People First and Reliable Enterprises and the um, and, and uh, Special Olympics, their eyes have been so open to how we can help and how we need to be more community based. I mean, I've got an 11 year old little girl who 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 knows a heck of a lot more about this stuff than I did at 11, and 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 that's the kind of generational changes we need to make in order to catch up. Uh, and really change uh, policy-wise on how we look at investments in our community. Oh, yeah. So. And, you know, you're spot on when you say we have to cultivate a new generation that does not have these old ideas about what people with developmental disabilities can accomplish in their lifetimes. Um, and you see it as an adult. A lot of people have adjusted their ideas. But when you're not with people with developmental disabilities, you're never going to really know that. Yes, And we, it, research shows that if you just know one person with a developmental disability, it raises your expectations for what they can accomplish and achieve. So we're, and we, we can be on the education topic um, for another 10 or 15 minutes, easy. <laughs> um, and, and were you on the education committee, I would come to you and say, hey, here's a couple of ideas that we have. So watch for removing that cap um, and for continuing to invest in inclusive practices in schools. Um, one last thing I want to mention on housing is that Commerce, uh, who is our partner in housing and, and holds a lot of our housing inventory, has said they need direction from the legislature to allow for forgivable grants and loans. So, you know, people with developmental disabilities by and large live on SSI, which is under $900 a month. They can contribute to rent at about $200 a month. So um, housing vouchers, but housing in particular that gets developed for that level of income is is difficult and called extreme even within the low income housing world. Um, and that's why uh, we need to make sure we don't fund our applications for that money that you give us in the capital budget in a way that it creates a lot of barriers for developers to build our housing. Um, so they need forgivable loans because they can't 
use rent to offset paying back that money. Okay. Um, and that's what we did early in development and housing. And we, we need to look at that again. So I just okay. mentioned that. All right. Well, I will be on the lookout and I'm sure um, you all will be bending my ear in my first uh, in-person session. And I'm looking forward yeah, to it. We're excited to see you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much very much. All right. Well, thanks again for taking time out of your day. Um, we get to wrap this up. Um, I just want to thank everybody for their time. This tremendous set of speakers. Diana Stadden, you have knocked it out of the park. Once again, you have earned your, your street cred and your merits today. This is an amazing lineup. Um, and we want to thank each and every one of these legislators for taking time with us. I know we're all a little bit richer for this experience and this conversation today. Um, as we mentioned, it will be recorded. Um, it has been recorded and it will be available in the next couple of days. Uh, Diana has put in the chat the evaluation form. Um, the DDC is our partner um, and we are very committed to making sure that our next advocacy days is accessible and uh, meaningful for everybody. So please give us your feedback so that we can continue to improve. Um, and then Brandy, I'll, I'll let you say the final word. Well, I just, yeah, that was amazing. And wow, I'm, yeah, I hope that you folks leave here with um, uh, the belief that we have elected officials that uh, really value what we're trying to do and want to participate and the knowledge that uh, it's us that's got to do it to make it happen. I'm, um, that was so cool. Thank you for starting my day out this way. That was awesome. Have a great day, everyone. See you later. <laughs>